I am Pippo Ranci, and I have spent, uh, I can say I have spent a good part of my professional life in preparing this conversation. Uh, the theme is energy regulation, theory, and practice. Uh, I am, I've been a university professor for a long time, looking into theory, and I have been a regulator for uh, seven years, looking into practice and, in fact, practicing. Uh, my presentation will go through five uh, points. One is the need of competition and regulation in any market. Two is what is specific of network services, and better, energy network services. Uh, then the transition from monopoly to competition. And then two specific issues. One is the unbundling of the networks, and the other is, in fact, regulatory institutions. So my first point is that, contrary to what is often said, markets need both competition and regulation. The advantages of competition have been widely explained and uh, illustrated. Uh, basically, competition assures uh, the freedom of enterprise on one side and the freedom of choice of the consumer on the other side. It uh, grants the benefits of efficiency that comes from the competitive pressure and also it is the ideal environment for promoting innovation. Uh, so it is good, but on the other side, some people go to the extreme of saying that you have more freedom and more competition if there are no rules, and this is a mistake. There is no fair competition in a market that is not subject to some regulation. We see it in all sectors, and we also see it with some specifics in the sector we are talking about, that is, energy network services. But everywhere, uh, we have a, a need for competition, and we know that competition does not happen by itself. This is why we have competition laws and competition policies practically in all countries in the world because companies naturally look for building up some market power, and that is equivalent to restricting competition. So they can be uh, counterbalanced by other companies, but sometimes this is not enough. And so we need uh, a competition frame of laws and a competition specific institution to counterbalance the piling up of market power uh, to prevent or punish the abuse of market power. Uh, this is uh, recognized as essential, although uh, not everywhere with the same experience. Uh, Antitrust legislation and, and, and practice has more than 100 years in the United States. It has bare 50 years or little more in the European Union. And now we look at our specific topic, which is network services, or more precisely, energy network services, that is electricity and gas. Uh, they have not been open to competition uh, for a long time. Uh, basically, the initial setting up of uh, an industry of electricity or a gas industry uh, is monopolistic. You have one operator uh, extracting gas or generating electricity in a plant and then setting down the network uh, to carry it to the consumer. Uh, so that is one operator. And only later, 
little by little, the network expands and links up with other networks. And you have a system, and the system might be open to several uh, companies. But here we have another problem, technical. That is, it is technically much easier to run an electricity network which has to be taken at a certain level of tension and frequency or a gas network which has to be maintained at a certain level of pressure if you have it in your hands and if you are the only operator in the area. So we have a situation where there are technical reasons for monopoly. Uh, they are called uh, sometimes a natural monopoly. Well, in fact, uh, around the mid-1980s, it became clear that uh, it was not necessary to have a monopoly all over the industry. It was possible to maintain a unique network, but have several companies producing and selling electricity, extracting and selling gas. And that was possible, that is possible, if you look at the network as an essential facility that is open to the use by competitors. This was the revolution started around the mid-1980s and the basic idea is competition among companies that have free access to the existing network. And free also implies that the conditions for this access should not be discriminatory, should be fair. How can this happen? Remember that we started off with one company integrated, that is, one company having both production and trade and sale of energy and construction and operation of the network. And, the, and these two activities have to be separated. This happened in various ways, um, according to the region, uh, in the United States, in, in Britain, in the continental Europe, in other continents. But the transformation was rather simultaneous and with very uh, common features, the one that I have described. How did this happen? How was this uh, enacted? Uh, well, first you have uh, the necessity of going from one company to many companies. And it is not only separation of the network, but also you have to have many companies competing among themselves. Uh, this was done in various ways, by political in intervention in Britain, for instance, through a structural reform that consisted in imposing a breakup of the existing company, divesting plants and selling them so that in a short time a reasonably high number of operators developed. Or you have another way of doing it, which is typical of continental Europe, <clears throat> open up the frontiers and let the company in this area enter the neighboring area. And at that time, you have two companies in place of one. And if you do that many times, you have many companies. So some way you have to have a structural reform. Then you have to set up organized markets, what we call power exchanges or gas exchanges, that is, places, physical or virtual, where operators can sell and buy without even knowing whom they are selling to or buying from. And this makes it much easier to trade, uh, much easier than going around and looking for a contractual partner and negotiate a bilateral contract. And then, final, regulation had to be reorganized 
There was some regulation, of course, because if there was a monopolist, the monopolist could not be left free to set prices and tariffs. But now, in the new context, you have to have a new way of regulating the markets and the access to the network. So, the two key issues are separation of the network and regulation. And these are the two issues I will look into in our remaining time. First, the issue of separation or unbundling between network and other activities. Well, this is necessary because, you, as you can imagine, if you have a competition among companies, but one of these companies is also the network company, well, that company will be tempted to create difficulties to their competitors in accessing the networks. And that is easy if you control the network. There is another subtle uh, reason, and that is that uh, the company can charge a very high tariff for use of the network. You can charge it to all, but of course uh, it will not affect your own business because you pay with one hand and you receive with the other hand. But the others, they will be penalized. Uh, then there is another reason again. If you have a network company and you trade energy at the same time, and you have a dominant position in an area, uh, you will not be happy to build an interconnector that will merge your area with the neighboring area, which might be highly competitive. So the policy of investment is also affected by this integration of company. For these reasons, it has become crucial to unbundle the activity of the network from the other activities of uh, producing and selling energy. But what is unbundling? Uh, since we had integration, vertical integration at the beginning, and there was a resistance of the companies uh, to give it up, uh, then unbundling was generally introduced stepwise. First, keep separate accounts, network on one side and the other activities on the other side. Then, have separate departments in your company with separate managers. Then, set up separate companies with uh, separate administ different administrators. But finally, the radical solution is have separate companies with different shareholders so that there is no overlapping of interest. Uh, the regulation imposing the different and increasing levels of uh, unbundling uh, has been an evolutionary exercise. And uh, both in the United States and in Europe, this evolution is not yet come to the end. Uh, we are at various stages of it. But on the other side, we notice that markets evolve as well as reg regulation. So that we have companies who spontaneously sell the networks because they need capital to invest in exploration and uh, uh, buying other companies in other countries, increasing their energy activity. So that one way or the other, uh, unbundling is in fact happening and we are heading towards a world in which there will be network operators on one side and energy companies on the other. Last point, regulation. Regulatory institutions have been radically renovated or set up 
if they did not exist in all countries in the world. This has been a simultaneous and impressive transformation in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, which are the characters of these uh, uh, regulators? Uh, different. Uh, they are in general considered as independent. And that is a difference with respect to the old regulation. What do we mean? Independent with respect to the regulated com companies, of course. They have to be protected from what is called capture. Uh -huh. That is uh, excessive influence of the regulated companies on their regulator. But also, well, if you, if you have cases, and you have cases in which the government is the shareholder of a large energy company, in that case, the regulator should be independent from government as well, because otherwise, uh, the regulator would, uh, in a way, depend on someone who is interested in the profit making of the energy company. But also, for other reasons, uh, regulation needs to be built and create an environment uh, of stability to facilitate investment and uh, proper management of the companies. So it should be uh, at arm's length from uh, the political debate, the changing of political majorities, uh, the different urgent needs that can uh, arise in the continuous mediation that is typical of political activity. They should be dedicated to the task that is their mission and concentrate on that. On the other side, of course, they should not be non-accountable, independent, but accountable to government, to parliament, in the sense that they provide um, a description of the result of their activity, which should be uh, consistent with uh, the directives that have been expressed by the political bodies, but at the same time, they should not uh, be subject to specific interference in specific decisions. Uh, they should be free to choose the instrument that they see best in reaching the goal that has been set by the political authorities. This is happening in various degrees, and it is, you look, uh, the variety of uh, regulatory institutions that we have in Europe, and you have the same in, around the world. A brand new breed of institutions, a new bureaucracy in a way, uh, that is younger, uh, than the ministerial bureaucracies, uh, specialized, technically, professionally prepared. And for instance, at least in Europe, it is less nationalistic and more European, uh, which is uh, good for good regulation and maybe also good for helping the process of continental integration, which is not specific of energy, and uh, which is desirable in itself. Or, at least, it is desirable in my view. Thank you.